hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for listening to my talk. I'll be telling you about generative adversarial networks today. Okay, thank you. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen so you can see my slides. Uh, so I'll be telling you about generative adversarial networks, or GANs for short. And just a little bit of background about me. Um, my name is Ian Goodfellow. I'm a research scientist at OpenAI. It's a nonprofit dedicated to making uh, general artificial intelligence in a way that is as safe as possible and benefits as much of humanity as possible. And generative adversarial nets are a kind of generative model. The basic idea behind a generative model is to take a lot of training examples from the training set and to uh, learn the probability distribution that generates those training examples. And then some kinds of generative models can actually give you an estimate of the function that defines that probability distribution. Other generative models can give you new samples that come from that same distribution that generated the training set. So in the bottom row, I have several examples of images from the ImageNet data set. And on the left, we have some training images. On the right, we could imagine that what a perfect generative model would do is give you more of those training examples. Uh, these here are actually just more examples from the ImageNet training set. Our, our generative models are not quite sophisticated enough to perfectly solve the task yet. The way that generative adversarial networks do this is by making two different networks play a game against each other. One of them is called the discriminator network, and it can look at both real or fake data and output a probability that is trying to estimate whether that data is real or fake. The other network is the generator network. The generator network takes some kind of random noise as input and transforms that random noise into a randomly selected example from the distribution that the network is learning to model. So the way that the training procedure works is that there are two different steps. One step has only the discriminator participating. We'll refer to the discriminator as a function D that maps from the space where the examples lie. We'll call the examples X. And it takes an input X that's sampled from the training data. Then the function D is applied and outputs a number between 0 and 1. And in this part of the game, the discriminator is trying to make this value be very close to 1. So when this value is close to 1, it means that the probability that the input image is real is high. And in this half of the game, the image really is real because we're drawing it from the training set. So if the discriminator succeeds, it should output a 1. In the other half of the game, we draw random noise and feed it through the generator network. And then we use that noise to actually produce a fake image as the output of the generator network. Then we apply the discriminator network again. And this time, it tries to output a 0 to indicate that its input is very likely to be fake. From the point of view of training these two models, the discriminator is basically just a binary classifier trained with supervised learning where half of the examples it sees should be uh, classified as zeros, and half of the examples it sees should be classified as ones. The thing that's interesting and different from the way we usually train neural networks is the way we train the generator network. The generator network is actually trained to fool the discriminator. So we need to use a different gradient backpropagated through the discriminator network uh, as the source of the gradient for the generator. One very simple approach is we can just take the negative of the discriminator's gradient and then continue to backpropagate that through the generator. It's also possible to use a slightly different loss function for the generator that requires a second computation of the gradient. But the basic idea is that the discriminator tries to accurately tell whether data is real or fake, and the generator tries to produce fake data that fools the discriminator. Using game theory analysis techniques, we can actually prove that there is an equilibrium to this game where the generator makes data that looks identical to the training data and the discriminator assigns probability one half to every input being real or fake. Uh, generative adversarial networks first began to work really well and uh, the modern generative adversarial networks architectures are based on a paper called Deep Convolutional Generative Adversarial Networks or DCGANs that was written by Alec Radford and Luke Metz at Indico. Uh, 
and Sumit Shintala at Facebook AI Research. The basic idea of the DCGAN architecture is to use several layers of what is colloquially called deconvolution. Uh, deconvolution is kind of like convolution, but run backwards. Uh, it's the same operation that's used during backpropagation to train a supervised convolutional network. You can think of it as being kind of like convolution, except that the size of the image gets a little bit bigger instead of getting a little bit smaller. And if you move the kernel by more than one position on each step, if you use a stride greater than one to use TensorFlow terminology, then the image actually gets quite a lot larger every time you apply a deconvolution layer. One of the other important ideas in this paper was to use batch normalization in most layers of the network. And that allows it to learn much faster and be much more stable. One other interesting idea was uh, how to handle the idea of pooling layers in the generator network. Traditional convolutional networks had pooling layers that take the maximum or average of large regions of input space every, every few layers in order to shrink the size of the representation. When we make a generator network, we need to do something resembling the inverse of that. As the representation becomes bigger and bigger as we move from the code to the generated image at the end, we need something that actually expands the spatial size of the representation at each step. Since the max pooling operation is not actually invertible, it wasn't entirely clear what we should do. The basic idea in the DCGAN paper is to just not try to have any kind of inverse of the pooling operation, to just have uh, deconvolution with stride of two or greater, and that that will actually increase the size of the representation as much as we need. And there's no need to explicitly do anything resembling max pooling. Some of those ideas came from a paper called the all convolutional net that came out a little bit earlier. Deep convolutional generative adversarial networks work very well for generating small images from restricted domains. So here are some examples of bedrooms that have been generated by deep convolutional generative adversarial networks after training on a data set consisting only of bedrooms. And these images are somewhat low resolution, but you can see that they actually contain doors, windows, quilts, pillows, uh, headboards for the beds, lighting, and that kind of thing. Another very interesting result that came out of the deep convolutional generative adversarial network research was that uh, the, the researchers found that the code, the random noise that's used to, to specify which image should be generated as the input to the generator, actually begins to take on meaningful uh, roles that relate to uh, concepts that human beings actually recognize when describing objects. So by taking several different random values that all decoded to images of men with glasses and then averaging those code values together, the authors were able to find an image shown on the left uh, that is something like the average image of a man with glasses or, or the image corresponding to the average code for images of men with glasses. Then following the same procedure, moving from left to right, they were also able to find the average code for an image of a man, and then the average code for the image of a woman. And it turns out that you can actually do arithmetic on these kinds of vectors for describing images. So if you begin with a vector for man with glasses, subtract the vector for man, and add the vector for woman, you get the vector for woman with glasses. And by decoding slight variations on that vector, you can get several different images of women with glasses. This idea resembled something that had been shown earlier with language models, where word embeddings turned out to have interesting algebraic relationships. The word embedding for queen minus the word embedding for female plus the word embedding for male could give you something close to the word embedding for king, for example. In this case, it's somewhat more impressive that the arithmetic in vector space actually works, because we actually need to decode the vector that results from the arithmetic and get an image where all of the pixels actually make sense. In the case of word embeddings, we just needed to find a new vector from arithmetic that was very close to the embedding vector for some other word. It didn't need to actually decode into a real world experience. And here we've actually shown that we can take the vectors resulting from arithmetic and map them back to the real world. <laughs> 
One of the biggest problems with training a generative adversarial network is called mode collapse, or sometimes called the Helvetica scenario. The basic idea is that the generator can accidentally start to produce several copies of exactly the same image. So the reason is related to the game theory setup. We can think of the way that we train generative adversarial networks as first maximizing with respect to the discriminator and then minimizing with respect to the generator. If we fully maximize with respect to the discriminator before we start to minimize with respect to the generator, everything works out just fine. But if we go the other way around, if we minimize with respect to the generator and then maximize with respect to the discriminator, everything will actually break. And the reason is that if we hold the discriminator constant, it will describe a single region in space as being the point that is most likely to be real that, rather than fake. And then the generator will choose to map all noise input values to that same most likely to be real point. We can partially fix that problem by adding some extra features to the discriminator, where the discriminator actually looks at an entire mini batch of samples at a time, rather than looking at a single sample. If those features measure things like distance to other samples, then the discriminator can detect if the generator is starting to collapse in this way. Instead of encouraging every sample from the generator to move toward the single most likely point, the mini batch as a whole has to look realistic and have uh, the correct amount of spacing between different samples. We call this mini batch features for generative adversarial networks. And it was an idea from Tim Salomons that we put in a, a paper that we submitted to NIPS uh, this year from OpenAI. Using mini batch features improves the quality of samples from generative adversarial networks quite a lot. One of the data sets where we tested this idea is CIFAR 10. It's a data set containing small 32 by 32 color pixel images of uh, 10 different object classes, including birds, airplanes, cars, trucks, and horses. If you look on the left, you can see what the training data looks like. So the images are not amazing quality to start with just because they're so small. And if you look on the right, you can see the samples that came from our model. And these samples actually contain many different recognizable uh, instances of several different object classes. You can see things like horses, cars, ships, and so on. Not every sample on the right actually looks like an object. I'd say maybe about 40% of them are just you know, color and texture blobs without recognizable form. But a good number of them actually do contain meaningful objects. We also scaled up the mini batch GAN algorithm to run on the ImageNet data set at a resolution of 128 by 128. ImageNet has a 1,000 object classes, so it becomes much more challenging. And in particular, the mode collapse problem that I described earlier makes it very difficult to learn generative adversarial networks when there are many different kinds of outputs that can occur. So for ImageNet, where there are 1,000 classes, it's an especially challenging problem. If you look at the images on the left, you can see that these images that we're working with are now much more high quality than the ones on CIFAR 10 were. That's because uh, the spatial extent is about four times greater in each direction. You can also see that there's so many different categories that it's now no longer easy for a human to look at an image and say exactly what it should be. For example, there's one cell here where there's a tile roof, and I'm not really sure if the class is supposed to be tiles or roof or house or what. So the important thing to take away from this is just that there's really a lot of diversity to capture now. In the plot on the right, you can see what happens when we train a mini batch GAN on this larger, more diverse data set. There are actually some recognizable objects, like on the top row, there's something that looks like kind of a fat dog. And you can also see dog faces and cat faces and eyeballs and things like that spread throughout some of the other samples. But most of them are not really coherent. Most of them look sort of like Dali or Picasso type texture uh, shapes without much form and composition overall. If we look at some very highly cherry picked results, we can see that sometimes the generative adversarial net is doing something relatively useful. And we can also get an idea of exactly how it fails, even in the best case. So in the upper left, we have an image. There, there's actually pretty nice composition. It looks like there's something like a mother dog next to her puppy. And in this case, it actually has the dog standing next to each other, looking in the same direction. And there's kind of a meaning to the scene overall. 
But as you can see, the scene is not very 3D. The background doesn't make very much sense compared to the dogs in the foreground. We also get a lot of images where it just doesn't make very much sense at all. We have this thing that is like a giraffe head with no body, multiple eyes, or this thing that looks a little bit like some kind of giant spider, even though I don't think there's anything resembling that in the training set. One thing we see a lot of the time is the inability to understand which textures go with which shapes, which is actually kind of an interesting case of the model overgeneralizing. So in the lower left, we see this example of this animal that has cow fur, but it has actually uh, four legs and two bodies, basically. It has one body where it's walking on the two hind legs and another body where it's walking in a four-legged position. So the model has learned about both two-legged and four-legged animals, but it doesn't know not to combine both of those ideas. And it also doesn't really have any idea that two-legged animals shouldn't have cow fur like this. One thing we see really, really commonly is just a uh, complete lack of 3D composition. So here we have this picture with a very nice recognizable dog face and actually dog fur that goes really well with the dog. But it basically looks like the dog has been skinned and laid flat on the ground. And then the photo taken directly above the dog looking straight down with uh, what's called an orthographic projection. So in this case, the model doesn't really understand how to do perspective at all. Also, we know that convolutional networks can count because there are a lot of applications where they need to do things like transcribe uh, address numbers from images where they need to know how many digits are in the number. But it looks like if you don't explicitly train neural networks how to count, it's not something that they will automatically learn how to do. In this image on the lower right, there is a picture of something that looks like a panther or a black cat face but it actually has too many pieces of the face inside it. There's sort of half of a face over here and then a completed face over here. And it seems like the neural network has an idea that there needs to be eyes and mouths and noses, but it doesn't know how many of them there should be or exactly where they should lie. Oh yeah, okay, so sorry. Well, I'm looking at my slides, I don't see the chat. So I periodically flip back to look at the chat. Um, I see Jessica Young asked about mode collapse. And it looks like Eric has answered that question sufficiently. So I think I'll, I'll move on. Thank you, Eric. There are a lot of different applications that we can do with generative adversarial networks. Uh, one of them is text to image generation. So in this paper by Scott Reed and his collaborators, generative adversarial networks are given an actual input that they need to convert into a corresponding image. What I've described so far is a generative adversarial network that just tries to make images randomly coming from the same distribution as the training set, but it doesn't have any particular input telling it which image it should make. In this newer paper, generative adversarial networks are augmented with an extra input that tells them a description of the image they should make. And this means that the generator network takes both random noise and the input sentence as input. And the discriminator also needs to tell not only whether the image that comes out is realistic, but also whether that image is correctly uh, paired with the input sentence. So we can see that there are many different descriptions of images, like this small, per this small bird has a pink breast and crown and black primaries and secondaries. And we actually get images that more or less match uh, the requested image. We do actually see that there's still some mode collapse going on here. For example, in the lower right, look at this description of the flower. We get images that actually have white, white petals and you know, the yellow center, just like the sentence is asked for. But all of these are more or less the same flower, shown from more or less the same direction. They all have, for example, longer petals in the lower right over here. And they all have more or less the same number and size of petals. So the model is still struggling to make very diverse outputs. But the nice thing is that the different input sentences are all mapped more or less correctly to images that correspond to the input sentence. So the input sentence gives it some kind of diversity, but then for any individual sentence you make, there's still not very much diversity in the output. And that's an ongoing research problem to solve. Um, I see that Ite has asked, uh, what is the performance or learning differences between deep belief network and convolutional networks to GAN network. 
so to answer that quickly, um, convolutional neural networks are a kind of architecture for a neural network. They aren't necessarily designed to learn to generate sets of images. Um, and they can be used to build many different things, including GANs and including deep belief networks. And then the other part of the question is, what's the performance and learning difference between deep belief networks and GANs? So deep belief networks are based on a model that comes from statistical physics, where you write down an energy function uh, that describes how likely different images are. If an image has very low energy, then it's more likely to occur. It's kind of like if you have uh, a, a rock on a mountain, the rock has much lower energy, lower potential energy due to gravity if it is rolled to the bottom of the mountain. So you're more likely to find a big pile of rocks at the bottom of a mountain than at the top. Um, the difficulty with deep belief networks is that a lot of the computations required to simulate those physics get to be really, really complicated. And so they haven't scaled up to large color images very well. They work really well on things like MNIST, but uh, there aren't really competitive results with using deep belief networks on, on for example, ImageNet yet. Um, and then I see Eric has also asked a question about the text-to-image GAN um, and whether there is a code as well as the sentence input. And the basic answer is that you could probably get away with omitting the code, but in most applications, people have both the input to condition on and the code so that there can be uh, some ver variety in the ways that the conditional input is transformed to an output. That way you can actually learn a whole conditional distribution where you can get many different results for the same input instead of just one. Uh, a lot of different people have come up with their own really fun applications of generative adversarial networks since Indico and Facebook released the DCGAN code. And there's a lot of these like just generating new images of flowers, generating new uh, cartoon characters and so on. One of my personal favorites that I thought was pretty funny was generating new species of Pokemon. Um, and here you can actually watch this YouTube video where you see the learning process and how the images become more realistic over time as the generator is forced to learn to fool the discriminator. And we actually do get things that look reasonably similar to realistic Pokemon, but also that generalize in new ways. Um, these don't end up with quite as realistic of imagery as some of the uh, professional research papers you see. But you know, just off the shelf, it's actually pretty good as far as modern generative models go. A recent paper that came out is describing how to use generative adversarial networks to do super resolution. And I'm not sure exactly how well this will show up over the video chat, because my video chat is probably losing some resolution anyway. The basic idea is that you can use a conditional generative adversarial network to take a low resolution image as input and produce a high resolution image as output. Well, the reason we want to use a generative model for this is that it's an under constrained problem. There could be very many different high resolution images for each low resolution image. And in particular, we'd like to use a generative adversarial network rather than another kind of generative model because generative adversarial networks are specialized for making very realistic samples. They're not particularly good for estimating probability density functions. But in this case, the, the final product that we care about is the actual output image rather than the distribution over images. As we can see in the image on the left, this is the ground truth or what the actual high resolution image should look like. The other images are generated by uh, downsampling the image and then taking the downsampled version and feeding it to different methods of upscaling the image to try to get back to where we started. So if we use just the hand-designed bicubic interpolation method, we actually get an image that looks kind of fuzzy and soft. Um, but then another deep learning approach is able to do a better job that's still a little bit fuzzy, but has cleaned things up quite a lot compared to the bicubic sampling. And then um, the generative adversarial network-based approach actually gets a lower signal-to-noise ratio than either version. Uh, the other deep model actually increased the, the um, signal-to-noise ratio a little bit, or, or decreased the signal-to-noise ratio a little bit. 
even though it looks better perceptually. The generative adversarial network is actually scoring very well, both on the quantitative metric and makes images that are really crisp and sharp and look good to a human observer. Um, I see uh, Chen Chung has asked, um, I'm from a top AI media sync. Uh, I can't read Chinese characters, sorry, from China. We have more than 1 million readers who are mostly professionals in the industry. Many of our readers are very interested in your work, and they asked me to help them bring their questions regarding GAN to you. Um, and asks, what are the major difficulties in efficiently training GANs? What are the current efforts in addressing them? Um, the main difficulty is you know, mode collapse and other, other problems related to uh, finding the equilibrium of the game. And the main efforts to solving them are designing new algorithms that actually look for equilibria in games, rather than just minimizing neural network cost functions. Um, and if you'd like to email me at ian at openai.com, I could point you to a little bit more material on that particular subject. Um, and then the follow-up question is about whether this uh, dynamics is evolutionary. I would say it's actually not really. Evolution is random, and neural net training uses the gradient to guide its updates. So some pretty cool recent results actually use generative adversarial networks to improve, um, to automatically assist an artist. So you might not be able to paint very well yourself, but using this uh, generative adversarial network assisted art program coming from Berkeley and Adobe, you can draw just this triangle and the generative adversarial network will automatically search for an image that has similar features and fill in uh, this mountain texture in the area where you drew the triangle and fill in grass texture in this area where you painted wavy green lines. Um, a very similar idea that came out very recently is also um, introspective adversarial networks, which I actually just heard about yesterday. Um, and that's essentially the same idea of having an image editing program where as you paint on the image, the generative model is used to actually make a photorealistic version of what you're painting so that whenever you make edits, you don't actually end up with an unrealistic image. You are able to continually change whatever you'd like to see there and get something that looks realistic instead of something that looks like you scribbled it with your mouse. And I think that there will continue to be a lot more applications of generative adversarial networks. Uh, so in conclusion, generative adversarial networks are generative models based on supervised learning and game theory. They can learn to generate realistic samples. And they still need a lot of improvement, but they're already useful for a lot of different image modification tasks. And they'll probably continue to be useful for more tasks that require generating realistic samples in other domains. Um, so I'm free to answer questions for a little while. Um, I see Ite asked, you have explained the problem with GAN about not knowing how to place body parts and textures well within the ImageNet generative examples. What do you think is the solution to those problems? So that's kind of hard to know, actually. Um, it might be because the training algorithm isn't good enough. Part of the problem with the training algorithm right now is that it's designed to minimize the cost for each player, but it's not designed to find the equilibrium of a game. So as an example, let's think about the game Rock, Paper, Scissors. You've got two players who can choose rock, paper, or scissors. And we, you, know, you win if, if your opponent chose scissors and you chose rock, for example. Well, let's say that you play rock and your opponent plays paper. Then you could say, OK, I've learned that they're going to play paper. On my next turn, I'm going to play scissors. And then uh, they saw that. Um, they see that you played scissors, and so then they update to playing rock, and then you can just keep chasing each other around forever without actually converging to the equilibrium. The equilibrium in this game is for each of you to play uh, rock with one-third probability, scissors with one-third probability, and paper with one-third probability. But if your learning algorithm doesn't have a low enough learning rate, you won't actually end up doing that. Um, in this case, the game is simple enough that just lowering your learning rate can find the equilibrium for you. 
for generative adversarial networks, the game is more complicated. And just decreasing the learning rate isn't enough to guarantee we'll actually find the equilibrium. We probably need some kind of specialized algorithm. Or we might need some way of reformulating the game so that, so that gradient descent with a low learning rate can actually find the equilibrium. So that's a relatively difficult research problem that a lot of people, including myself, are still working on. Um, and then I guess just tying it back to specifically the problem with how to place body parts uh, and, and just get good 3D texture and stuff, we might actually just need to make a more complicated architecture. Oh, like for example, the generator nets we train right now are not very deep. If we had an extremely deep ResNet generator, it might be able to learn to uh, coordinate different parts of the image that are far apart better. Or we might need to do something like add special operations to the graph. Like if we added things that look a little bit like the OpenGL rendering pipeline. Um, like if you've seen uh, spatial transformer nets for classification, you could imagine running spatial transformer nets that take textured polygons and place them wherever they want in the image. Um, another, another member of the audience asks, uh, what application of GAN will be the commercial killer app? Uh, well, so I think the automated painting could already be a really good feature for something like Photoshop, where just commercializing the things that have already come from the last few slides I showed could actually be really useful. But another one is uh, speech synthesis. So neural networks are starting to be really good at speech synth. And there was a paper from DeepMind recently about a model called WaveNet uh, that can produce very realistic human speech. And the problem with WaveNet is that it's very slow to generate samples. That kind of generative model has to generate every component of the output one step at a time. So in the case of WaveNet, it's generating audio samples at uh, something like 12 kilohertz. And so you have to run 12,000 neural networks in sequence uh, with each neural network receiving the output so far as its input. And that means that it takes about two minutes to generate one second of audio. It's not possible for the neural network to actually speak in real time. And improvements to the software efficiency and improvements to hardware might eventually make that faster, but it still seems like we're looking at several years before the WaveNet approach is fast enough to generate audio in real time. Things like generative adversarial networks could actually, in theory, provide us with very fast uh, text to image synthesis, or sorry, text to speech synthesis. And the next question is where do you see GANs being applied outside of image related tasks? So I guess, yeah, speech kind of answers that question too. Um, and then someone else asks, how can you generate feedback loop in a GAN so it generates an output similar to an input in its dimensions, but to predict the next step in a time series, i.e. a video sequence, uh, like in the case of WaveNet. So yeah, you could actually just take the WaveNet architecture and use that as your generator net. And then the backpropagation algorithm will just work correctly. Um, and then UMBC campus asks, what do you predict it will take to get the output to scale to much larger output dimensions? Uh, it's not actually really that hard to scale the output dimension. For example, the largest I showed in my talk was 128 by 128 images. But Facebook has already done 256 by 256 images in, in their latest paper. Usually, it's not so much hard to make the output dimension get really large because convolution is really efficient in terms of just producing very large images. What's harder is to get. Uh, really a lot of diversity of images that have correct details in them. Um, yeah, so go to Carter asks if GANs can be used for data compression. And I think that, yes, they probably could be. Most generative models can, in principle. Um, for generative adversarial networks, you would probably need some way of getting from the image to the code that describes the image. So the version of generative adversarial networks that I described only has a mapping that goes one way from code to image. But there are other things um, like adversarially learned inference from University of Montreal and bidirectional GANs from Berkeley that have an encoder layer that goes the other direction from image to code. So you could use the encoder layer to produce a small code and then look at the difference between the decoded image and use something like a, a hard-coded 
compression algorithm to compress the difference. And if you're lucky, that difference will be small enough to compress that the end result will use a lot fewer bits than the original image. Um, someone else asked what my goal is with GANs. I'm most interested in improving the training stability. And that's something I spend a lot of time on. Uh, but it's, it's actually a fairly difficult problem. I do also spend a little bit of time working on new architectures. But uh, so far, those don't seem to matter very much compared to the stability issue. Um, Ite asks again, can I elaborate more on the feedback question? So I, I guess, do you, do you have like a concrete question about like what exactly you want to know how to do? The, the basic idea is if you have a generator algorithm, a generator network that takes its own outputs as inputs, it, it will do what you want. Uh, so like if you have a layer that maps from the code to the first frame of video and then you make another layer that maps from the previous frame of video and the code to the next frame of video. You can just recursively apply that second layer as many times as you want. And it should make a, a decent video sequence for you. People haven't really been uh, studying that task and publishing on it very much. I think there is actually, I think there's a paper from Facebook AI research about video generation that involved an adversarial network loss. Uh, but most of the work with generative adversarial nets so far has been on images. Oh, there's also, actually, there's a paper by uh, William Lauder and his collaborators uh, about predicting uh, 3D synthetic video sequences. Uh, and so you could, you could actually read either of those papers, the one from Facebook AI Research or the one from uh, William Lauder and his collaborators. And, the, and those would describe in concrete detail exactly what they did and how well it worked. I think in both of those cases, they actually relied on bringing in a few extra things, like using mean squared error of the prediction of the next frame in order to help stabilize the training a little bit. And in Facebook's case, I think they also added a loss that was based on uh, like comparing the edges in the image to make sure that the generated video didn't end up being blurry. And one thing that's really hard with video prediction is that usually most models just predict that um, you should copy the same frame forever or they predict that everything should just blur out to nothing because it has so much uncertainty about each pixel. And so it can be hard to get them to continue predicting sharp frames into the future. OK, well, thank you very much for being my audience today. And thank you for all your great questions. Uh, we are approaching my first one-to-one uh, -one time slot. So I should actually uh, wrap up here and move over to the one-to-ones. Um, thanks for attending. Feel free to email me if you have any questions about GANs. And uh, good luck with all of your AI work and research. Have a good day.